lines or a broad area within a short span of time, much in the manner of Genghis Khan, to highlight the theme of our center, I will outline those specific, specific aspects that will help you appreciate the motivations behind the different problems that we are currently examining that will constitute a good fraction of the talk. Once I have explained the theme of the center, I will very briefly uh, you know, introduce the various members of the group and the various directions of research they are involved in. And finally, I will very briefly sketch the plans of action that we expect to implement over the next couple of years. So what's the theme of our center? Well, as you may know, there exist four fundamental forces of nature. I'm sure you have heard about gravitation. You have heard about electromagnetism from your school days. There also exists the strong force which keeps the nucleus together and the weak force which is responsible for radio radioactive decay. The strong and the weak forces operate on very small scales, very small length scales, and therefore they are intrinsically quantum in nature. In contrast, electromagnetism and gravitation operate on large scales and therefore they can be described by classical theory. For instance, you may have heard about the Coulomb's law, which is essentially uh, you know, arises in a classical theory of electromagnetism. Similarly, you would have heard about Newton's theory of gravitation, the inverse square law of gravitation, which is again arises from a classical theory of gravitation. There is another aspect that one needs to take into account. These theories, electromagnetism, the strong forces and the weak forces are intrinsically relativistic. The theory of gravitation that you're familiar with, the Newton theory was the earliest theory that was to be proposed. It was proposed in the 17th century. It took the whole of 19th century to arrive at a complete theory of electromagnetism. And as I mentioned, these three forces, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak forces are intrinsically relativistic. During the course of the, you know, and these force, these theories that describe the strong and the weak forces were put together in the 20th century. And in the process, actually, it was electromagnetism that was quantized first. And these are relativistic theories that describe electromagnetism, the strong and the weak forces. In contrast, as I mentioned, the classical theory that describes gravitation, the Newtonian theory is non-relativistic. You may have heard the fact that Einstein proposed something called special relativity, which describes you know, motion of particles when they are moving at velocities closer to the speed of light in 1905. About a decade later, he proposed a relativistic theory of gravitation, which we will refer to as you know, general theory of relativity to describe, you know, to put together gravity and special relativity. However, these methods that we have to quantize these theories, such as electromagnetism, the strong and the weak forces, the theories that describe these forces do not seem adequate to construct a relativistic, you know, a quantum relativistic theory of gravitation. That seems to be the challenge of the 21st century. There is another way of understanding these various theories. What has been plotted is often referred to as a cube of physics. We have three fundamental constants, namely the Newtonian gravitational constant G it appears here. The, quant, you know, the, the Planck's constant, which determines whether a theory is quantum or otherwise appears here. And the velocity of light appears as one over the velocity of light here. So if you are here, this corresponds to mechanics that you would have learned in school. It, no quantum mechanics is involved. The gravitational force is weak or non-present. And or you can include gravity and you know velocities remain small and you can approach Newtonian gravity that I talked about earlier, which can describe the motion of the earth around the sun, for instance. Or you can ignore gravity and you know turn to relativistic effects and arrive at special relativity that I talked about, which I said, which I mentioned that Einstein had formulated in 1905. Or you can turn on, you can assume that the velocities are small and turn on H bar and you arrive at a quantum theory, which is known as just like this is called classical mechanics, where quantum effects are not accounted for, you can arrive at quantum mechanics. The theories that describe the weak, the electromagnetic and the strong force appear here of this corner of the cube. They involve quantum mechanics and they also involve special relativity. When you put these two things together, you arrive at something called quantum field theory. And this quantum field theory is adequate to explain the other forces. However, if you want to approach a theory of quantum gravity, that is where you take into account the effects of gravitation, where you take into account the effects of relativity, and you take into account the effects of quantum mechanics, 
you know, these theory, these mecha these uh, procedures that we adopted to construct a quantum field theory do not seem to adequate to arrive at a quantum theory of gravity. And that's the challenge ahead of us. So what would be an approach to quantum gravity? You can go in four steps. If you have done some physics, if you have learned about some physics, you know, in order to construct a quantum theory, you need to first understand what happens in the classical physics. And our first goal is to understand the nature of the classical theory of gravitation. I already mentioned that we have a theory proposed by Einstein, which is called general relativity. As we speak, people are trying to understand whether this general relativity is consistent with the various observations. Something I will elaborate a bit later, over the last few years, we have been able to detect gravitational waves from merging binaries of black holes. These are where the, you know, gravity is the strongest and general relativity is expected to play a crucial role and various tests are ongoing to examine whether the classical theory of gravitation is indeed described by general relativity to the extent we have observed, it seems consistent with various observations. The next step is somewhat abstract or mathematical in nature. In order to understand whether the quantum versions, as I said, we are not able to construct a satisfactory quantum theory of gravitation, one can do the following, one can construct quantum versions and whether they are consistent in some manner. For example, you know, as I will describe a couple of slides later, black holes that you may have heard of carry something known as the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And there is an effort to understand whether this entropy of black holes can be explained some by these purported quantum versions of a classical theory of gravitation. Of course, the next thing in physics is to determine specific predictions of the theory. If you have a quantum theory of gravity, for instance, can you, you know, can it ensure that singularities do not form? Singularities are unphysical. They are places where, for instance, energy density can diverge. This can occur in the center of black holes or at the big bang that you may have heard of in the early universe. And a quantum theory of gravity has to ensure that, you know, these singularities do not arise. And somehow they need to smoothen these singularities and they may have some you know, non-trivial observational predictions. And these are the challenges before a theory that is purportedly quantum, intrinsically quantum in nature. That is a theory of gravity that is intrinsically quantum in, in nature. Of course, we need to compare the predictions of these theories with experiments less observations. Often this gravity is the strongest when you are looking on the, you know, either to close to black holes or on large scales such as the universe itself. And therefore it is often difficult to construct situations where gravity is the strongest to test the quantum theory of gravity. But nevertheless, some you know, people are examining whether you can construct tabletop experiments where the quantum nature of gravitation will sort of manifest itself. And as I will describe later, you know, we will just as electromagnetic waves can be generated even in the absence of sources, Gravitational waves, you know, just as a moving charge radiates, certain moving masses can emit gravitational waves. And that is how, you know, these merging binary black holes emit gravitational radiation. In the early universe, these electromagnetic, I'm sorry, gravitational waves can be generated even in the absence of sources, just as the electromagnetic waves can be. And there is efforts on to understand whether that we can see signatures of a quantum gravitational wave. I'm going to highlight how, you know, in the next couple of slides, how one tests a classical theory of gravity. What we have here is an amazing phenomena, and this constitutes what is known as a classical test of general relativity. What we see here is gravitational bending of light, often referred to today as gravitational NC. We have a quasar, I'm sorry, a large galaxy, which is between us and a quasar. A quasar is an extremely bright object, which is far away. It's like a core of a galaxy in some sense, which emits a large amount of light. And there is this, you know, blurred object here is a galaxy, which is in between, which contains a large amount of mass, you know, of collection of stars, and therefore a large amount of mass between us and the quasar. What has happened is that just like a lens turns these light rays and merges somewhere, this central object here has, you know, turned away, you know, different rays 
and brought it to our focus. And what we essentially see is this is the galaxy core. And what we see here, A, B, and C, and D are the same quasar, a same object, same astronomical object seen four times. And this arises due to gravitational lensing. And these observations are completely consistent with general relativity. In other words, as I, you know, general relativity seems consistent with the observations where, uh, when the gravitational field is weak. You know, in, in other words, the classical theory of gravity seems best described by general relativity. What about in the strong regime? The strongest regime occurs when two black holes, the strongest gravitational regime occurs when two black holes come close together. And what happens is that they come about, they rotate about each other and they eventually merge and form a single black hole as illustrated here. What we have plotted here is the velocities of these black holes in units of the velocity of light. Notice they you know, move at great speeds compatible to, comparable to the velocity of light and they merge at some point. And all this happens within a fraction of a second as you can see here. What has been plotted here is a gravitational waveform. It's often referred to as a chip chirp because you know it's like a chirping of a bird its frequency and its amplitude increases with time but for a very short duration and this has been observed from numerical results and something known as numerical relativity and using something called templates depending on the motion of these two black holes about each other and i didn't have you know space to include the actual observations what one finds is that the actual observations by this LIGO the laser interferometric gravity wave observatory match extremely well with the theoretical calculations. And this was the, actually the first detection of gravitational waves for which you know, um, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded a couple of years back. So this is the strong regime tests of gravity and such tests are going on as we speak. And there is greater and greater efforts to examine whether the general theory of relativity proposed by Einstein is indeed consistent with the observations. So let us say you have a classical theory as described by general relativity. How does one compare this with the, uh, with the, um, uh, with, with the results from a quantum theory? Well, one of the things you can look at um, is look at the origin of black hole entropy. What are black holes? Black holes are objects which do not emit light. They absorb that everything that they absorb everything that you throw in. And classically, they seem to um, you know take in everything, which means that I can carry take an object which has a non-zero entropy, throw into the black hole, and entropy outside the you know outside the black hole will disappear. If you recall the second law of thermodynamics that you may have learned from um, uh, uh, from your college days, it implies that the entropy should, you know, the change in the entropy in the absence of work should be always greater than or equal to zero. But in the presence of weak black holes, we seem to be able to, you know, um, break the second law of black hole thermodynamics. And, uh, you know, and it seems to disturb Bekenstein. And Bekenstein proposed that the black holes themselves should carry an entropy proportional to the area. In fact, one can show using work, you know, by done by Hawking much later, who showed that the black holes emit thermal radiation. They are not perfectly black. One can show that the entropy is related to A and in terms of fundamental constants like H, G, C, and the Planck's constant K. The challenge before us is to understand a microscopic origin of entropy. Entropy in the quantum theory is supposed to describe the number of microstates that are accessible to a system given you know, overall parameters, in this case, say the mass of the black hole. It is the mass of the black hole that determines the area and therefore the entropy. If you are given the mass of the black hole, what would like to know is what is the entropy of the system? You need a quantum theory to understand how many different states that are possible that are consistent with a given mass of the black hole. And in order to do so, you need to understand what are the microscopic degrees of freedom describing gravity, or in this case, the horizon of a black hole. And this is something people are currently investigating. In fact, people are trying to understand not only what is the leading correct leading term, which is proportional to the area, what are the sub-leading corrections? And there have been progress made in this context, including people by, you know, uh, by members of a group who are trying to understand what is the leading term and what are the sub-leading corrections, for instance, in certain, um, uh, certain theories of quantum gravity, such as string theory. 
the other place where we can understand you know the quantum the classical theory of gravity and the quantum nature of the uh, of the gravitational theory is from the early universe what happens is as follows we see matter around us apart from matter around us we also get to see radiation most of the radiation we seem to see is in the form of starlight but when you carefully around observe around the universe most of the radiation in the universe is actually not in the form of starlight is in the form of a background radiation that is often referred to as the cosmic microwave background and it is cosmic because it is omnipresent it comes to us from all different directions of the sky one finds that it is has an amazingly planckian shape it is extremely close to a perfect planck spectrum and the temperature of this radiation today is about 3 kelvin in fact it's about 2.725 kelvin to be precise but this temperature is almost the same at different directions of the sky as i mentioned it's called the background because it is present everywhere it's cosmic because it has a cosmic origin and it is called the microwave background because it peaks it intensity intensity peaks in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum as i said it is the same it has the same temperature in different directions of the sky but if you closely observe observe at the fourth or the fifth decimal place what we find is that there are slight differences in the temperature and that is what has been observed by in this uh, by this planck mission and has been plotted here just as you can plot the surface of the earth on an oval shape through something known as an itap projection the planck observations have been plotted across the sky across the you know 3 degrees 360 degree sky has been plotted in this oval in terms of what are known as anisotropies in the cmp that is the temperature in different directions of the sky are differ at one part in 10 to the power 5 you know and the challenge before us within the so called hot big bang model that is the popular model today is to be able to explain not only the extent of isotropy as the reason why the temperature is the same in the all directions of the sky but also to explain the extent of anisotropies why are the differences in the temperature in the different directions of the sky one part in 10 to the power 5 the challenges are twofold and these these are overcome through an epoch known as inflation which is supposed to have occurred during the early stages of the universe and what inflation does is that it generates primordial gravitational waves and those primordial gravitational waves from the early universe are supposed to have le left telltale imprints in these anisotropies which you know people are trying to observe today and in fact this is the holy grail in the context of uh, in the context of cosmology observing imprints of gravitational waves that are generated in the early universe these gravitational waves would have been generated due to quantum fluctuations and therefore you have some way of observing some aspect of a quantum gravitational signature so the theme of the center is as follows is to explore fundamental laws of physics from the larger scales in the universe i explained how on the larger scales it is gravity you know that is expected to play a role in in fact you need a relativistic theory of gravitation to explain the universe as a whole and also on the smaller scales because at the largest energies corresponding to probing the smaller scales you know you need a quantum theory of gravity to come in for instance near the singularities of black holes or near the black you know big bang singularity you expect you know a quantum theory of gravity to help you avoid these singularities the whole idea of our center the whole theme of our center is to explore the fundamental laws or you know from the larger scale down to the smaller scale determined by or dominated by quantum gravity with the aim of you know deriving specific signatures in particular you know if you have a quantum space time whether it leaves some signatures that can be measured you know observed in uh, forthcoming missions in the context of cosmology and gravitational wave physics that's roughly you know is the theme of our center having described our theme i will go on to you know very quickly uh, uh, introduce you to the members um, of our group and the kind of research they have been involved in uh, our, the senior member of our group is professor suresh govindrajan he is a string theorist he works on various aspects of quantum and 
uh, classical and quantum aspects of black holes. He's also interested in mathematical aspects of quantum field theory as well as string theory. And of late, he has also been interested in statistical physics and conformal theory, conformal field theory. The second member of a group is Daud Kotawala, and his domain of expertise is classical and quantum gravity. He's interested in the small scale structure of space time. In particular, he's interested in examining whether some high energy effects possibly motivated by, uh, uh, by quantum gravity can leave imprints in, uh, at smaller scales in, you know, whether it can change the behavior of quantum field theory. And he's also interested in the fate of space-time singularities, um, you know, I talked about earlier. And he's also interested in understanding the cosmological constant cosmological constant seems absolutely required in order to explain the acceleration of the universe observed today. And the question Dowd is interested in is understanding whether quantum gravity plays any role in you know, determining the value of the cosmological constant. The third member of our group is Chandrakan Mishra, Dr. Chandrakan Mishra, his domain of expertise is gravitational waves. As I mentioned, one of the things he has been focusing on is testing theories of gravitation. I had earlier talked about as to how the observations of gravitational waves from mergers of binary black holes seem to be consistent with general relativity, but there is an ongoing effort to understand whether it is indeed, the various observations are indeed consistent with general relativity. Chandra plays is, Chandra works on one of these, on Chandra's primary interest is testing theories of gravitation. He's also interested in modeling compact binary mergers and also probing the exotic states of exotic states of exotic matter that are present in the you know in the center of neutron star, for instance. The youngest member of our group is Dr. Ayan Mukhopadhyay. He's again you know a string theorist like Suresh Govindrajan. He's also interested in classical and quantum aspects of black holes. He's in particular interested in examining holo the relation between holographic holographic duality between gravity and strongly interacting systems. And uh, more recently, he's also interested in examining the origins of inflation in the early universe. And uh, this is me. I'm interested in various aspects of gravitation and cosmology, and specifically on inflation and the cosmic microwave background. Soon after inflation, your, the universe is supposed to have gone through an epoch of reheating. And I'm interested in examining the mechanism of reheating and its observational signatures. And I've also been exploring certain alternatives to inflation. In the next couple of slides, I will just mention the action plans and uh, you know, our contact addresses, our addresses for contact. The specific plans are as follows. We intend to conduct a special series of lectures. For instance, we have a series of Chandra Shekhar lectures planned. And the first lecture is actually scheduled for October 21. And we also intend to invite regular visitors, both from India and abroad. We expect to have a regular stream of visitors. You know, we are hoping that the pandemic over will be over soon so that we can have the visitors on campus. For instance, Professor Jerome Martin, our moderator today, is expected to visit us soon as a Serb Vajra faculty. We also intend to organize schools and workshops. We are in fact working towards conducting a school as well as a symposium on gravitation and cosmology as a school on black holes and gravitational waves early next year in January and February. And we also expect to simultaneously reach out to schools, colleges, and universities around and give talks. In fact, some of us have been doing this regularly. We intend to do it at a more regular basis over the next few years. And uh, I'm sorry, I seem to have missed uh, a slide containing our details. Uh, you know, if you wish to um, contact us, the best would be for you to write to one of us, either Suresh, Dawood, Chandra, Ayan, or me. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. So, thanks for the nice talk. And we should now take some questions. So maybe to start the question session, uh, Sriram, could you please uh, tell us why inflation is a scenario which is so popular nowadays in cosmology? So as I was trying to explain, you know, if you want to explain the 
observations of the cosmic microwave background, or rather the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background, uh, if you want to explain the specific pattern or even the extent of homogeneity, the extent of isotropy, namely the fact that the temperature in different directions of the sky is almost the same, you will not be able to explain within the hot Big Bang model. In the hot Big Bang model, you have an early epoch where radiation was dominant and later epoch where matter was dominant. And uh, this such a model, hot Big Bang model, is not able to explain the extent of isotropy of the CMB, namely the fact that the temperature at different regions of the sky, even antipodal points in the sky have the same temperature. If you want to overcome this difficulty, you need to introduce this inflation. What inflation amazingly does is that it also introduces quantum fluctuations naturally, which are responsible for the small deviations in isotropy that we actually observe. In the modern language, in fact, you know, the exquisite observations of the anisotropies in the CMB allow us to nicely construct, limit, you know, the kind of um, models, inflationary models that you require in the early universe. Thank you. So there are a lot of other questions. Maybe your first question is for Chandra. And the question is, what are binary black holes? Chandra, um, are you around? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so binary black holes, uh, uh, essentially one is referring to uh, a system of two black holes, uh, which are going about each other. And as Sri Ram showed in one, his, one of his slides that, you know, these uh, essentially move uh, closer and closer as uh, the time passes and they merge into a single black hole. And that is what we are calling binary black hole merger. Okay, thank you. There is a question about black hole. This is maybe for Suresh or Ayan. And the question is, how do you perform experiment with a black hole? Uh, well, you cannot really put a put a black hole on a table top. There are some experiments people try to do by creating analog black holes, but they're not quite real black holes. And uh, so you can simulate some aspects of the physics of black holes through there, or some some aspects of it. But a real black hole is really an enigma because uh, for various reasons. But there is one important thought experiment that people have already done. To, to say that a black hole should behave like a black body or uh, so that experiment was done by Beckenstein by saying that you take some 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 box or some uh, with some gas and you throw it inside the black hole a black hole will absorb it and once it goes inside it cannot return from it but then because you have thrown something hot into a black hole and just disappeared you have you have got rid you have de decreased the entropy of the universe so that leads to a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so to restore it, uh, what people have seen that, uh, so there were some important laws that were proved by Stephen Hawking and by based on earlier work of Penrose saying that the area of the black hole horizon can only increase. So that led to a very interesting speculation by Beckenstein that said that uh, the black hole uh, has an entropy. And then uh, the question was, if it has an entropy, it should also be behave like a black body. And, what Stephen Hawking's computation showed that it can indeed uh, emit radiation. It can indeed uh, uh, emit quantum mechanically, but its temperature is a nano Kelvin, extremely small if you take a sun sized black hole. So if you want to really, uh, really have a tabletop black hole, you have to be really lucky and see that you somehow can get a primordial black hole very close to our earth, uh, which has temperature of order of one Kelvin, which is extremely tiny horizon. And it has been, it has been somehow formed at very early stages of the universe when the densities were very high and by some fluctuation. And then you are lucky to observe it. Uh, so that's one of one, one if, 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 if you are that lucky, then we can certainly uh, hope to learn about black holes directly. But until then, uh, we can only have some, like these gravitational waves can give us, maybe if you are lucky to understand how to dig physics from it, we can get some clues to uh, the real uh, quantum nature of black holes. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, 
whether there, there are any new faults that have been discovered other than the four fundamental forces that were mentioned before. So maybe this is a question for uh, Dawood. Yeah, hi, Jerome. I actually could not uh, get the question completely. What was the question? The question is whether there is any new force that has been discovered other than the fundamental forces. Ah, any I new force it, other than the yes, yes, yes. I guess yes, it's a question yeah. about the possible existence of a fifth force. Ah, yes, I get it. So no, to the best of our knowledge, uh, uh, the four fundamental forces that we know of, which Sri Ram mentioned at the beginning of the talk, these are the ones that have been uh, observed and experimentally verified, not beyond. Th there have been theoretical proposals for forces like the one which Jerome just mentioned, like the fifth force and all. But uh, these are all uh, uh, proposals, not uh, something that you would call as observationally verified. Yeah. So I guess that was the... Uh... Yes, thank you. Uh... There is a question for Sriram. It's a comment about dark energy. Um, so the question says that the, due, the new dark energy survey calculation of the equation of state parameters says that there must be a modification of uh, the gravitational uh, theory, I guess, or the general relativity. Could you please comment on that? To my knowledge, I think they are consistent with uh, a cosmological constant and general relativity. Um, uh, so I press directly, indirectly. It is not clear yet, to my knowledge, that there is a deviation from general relativity. In fact, to the level I understand, it is the formation of structure in the universe and the rate at which that form that are expected to provide you know, um, one way of examining whether the deviations from GR, uh, the simplest idea, yes, modified theories of gravity may be able to explain in the same manner as dark energy, but they are not required at this stage. A simple theory of general, the simplest theory of gravity, namely general relativity, with a cosmological constant is able to explain the observations fairly well. Okay, now there is a question for um, Chandra. Uh, can strange matter only be seen in neutron star? Um, well, uh, uh, in, in standard physics, uh, we, we talk about, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, we, we mentioned neutron stars. Uh, uh, which we which we believe are uh, you know made of uh, neutrons uh, that's why the name but uh, uh, a number of other objects have been theorized uh, uh, which can have strange properties uh, such as uh, boson <coughs> stars uh, and glove stars and so on so yes in, in theory they have been predicted um, uh, and and uh, you know uh, the experiments uh, the ongoing experiments uh, do target uh, you know, to measure signatures of those things. But yes, in standard physics, uh, uh, when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, dense stars and the string matter in it, uh, we refer to neutron stars and white blobs. I hope that answers uh, the question. Thank you. Now there is a question for, uh, I guess, Suresh. Can and will string theory explain the, the, the black hole? Uh, okay, so <clears throat> first point is that it has not been proven that uh, string theory is is, uh, is the theory of quantum gravity which will describe our universe. That's still a question. It's an open question, but th there is no doubt that string theory does provide a quantum theory of gravity. So within that framework, uh, we have actually been able to uh, give, for instance, the microscopic uh, uh, counting of the states which contribute to the degeneracy of black holes, for instance. 
And now there is active work in this area of understanding uh, Hawking radiation and how how uh, the information law paradox might be addressed in this uh, in this framework. So. I think string theory will definitely give us insights into what might be happening in real world black holes, but that's something in the future. Thank you. There is a question for Ayan now. If a black hole does not emit light, then how can we detect a black hole? Yeah, I think I already, I, I mentioned that. So. Uh, the black hole essentially is like a black body, so it is supposed to have some black body radiation, except that uh, a real black hole of the, of the size of a sun would have extremely tiny temperature, which is of the order of nano Kelvin. Uh, so the only hope is that you can, uh, you can detect a black hole. Uh, if you're lucky, you can put in a particle collider, you can collide things, and you might be able to produce a black hole that immediately uh, uh, Hawking radiates and it's and there were actually proposals that in particle colliders you could create such black holes and observe their signatures. Uh, it will be a thermal radiation and all of this. Uh, so uh, so basically you and I also said that uh, you might hope that you can get a primordial black hole near the Earth and somehow detect it and study it. And there are some proposals. There is some something that has been seen nearby and people have proposed some some uh, to send like mini rockets towards that object and and measure it with something like a drone or something. Uh, so if, if, you could, uh, if you could be lucky, you need to be extremely lucky to be able to really, and this is why black hole physics is very hard. I mean, in most area of physics, we have a lot and lot of data. And with that data, you could, uh, it, it, it guides us towards a theory. But, uh, but GR, for example, Einstein came up with general relativity just based on logic and, uh, and, and, and physical reasoning based on what, what already what one understands without any data. And, and the confirmation of GR, like gravitational waves, even Einstein uh, was, uh, was not sure whether gravitational waves existed. So I think progress in black hole physics probably will happen like that, that most of it would come from physical reasoning. And, and uh, unless we are very lucky, uh, it will happen, happen from like, like what Suresh was saying, taking some uh, consistent framework and studying things within that framework and trying to answer questions. And, and I hope that uh, in, with such things, people will be able to make a lot of progress and then we can understand later how to test it or how to, uh, so it's just like it happened with gravitational waves. Thank you. So there is another question for Suresh, I guess. Uh, the question is, there is theoretical belief of existence of white hole. Is it possible to create one? And what will be its implication for the mathematical aspect of our theory, I guess, uh, theory of quantum gravity or string theory. Ayan, can you answer this? I don't want to answer it. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I, I don't have a very good answer. Basically, I don't know the answer either because indeed there is, uh, I mean, so black, white hole essentially is a time reverse of a black hole where you, you you can only uh, radiate uh, uh, you can only radiate uh, which only it it, it it spews out you never but classical GR has we know at least if you have, if you, if there is any theory of gravity that if, if so first of all if you have a quantum gravity theory you should be able to see how you can reproduce classical GR right and string theory is one of the nice things because uh, it reproduces or it predicts classical GR you know. So many other approaches are unable to do that. But that's one of the good things. But if you get a classical GR approximation, then, then there are very strong theorems or strong understanding developed by Hoffman and Penrose, which tells essentially why, uh, gra although gra gravity as a fundamental theory is, is reversible in time, but operationally, you always see uh, entropy increase and you always see a black hole, but never a white hole. Although white hole solution is also physical solution, it's an acceptable solution to the equations of motion, but in, in practice, it would never, never. So gravity has some, gravity is probably the only microscopic theory or only classical theory that has some inbuilt irreversibility or inbuilt, uh, in, 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 inbuilt statistical property associated with it, which is really amazing property of, of the laws of gravity actually. But I don't have a much deeper answer to this question. Thank you. A, a question for Chandra. Uh, there are intermediate class of black holes in the core of several galaxies. 
what keep them or prevent them from swallowing the galaxy at a high rate? Um, uh, so Jerome, uh, is this, uh, did you say intermediate mass black holes or? Uh, intermediate uh, class of black holes in the core of the galaxies. Uh -huh. And the question is, given that we see these black holes at the center of the galaxies, what keep them or prevent them from swallowing the galaxy at a high rate? For um, accreting matter uh, at a high rate. Um, so, uh, well, um, I, I probably uh, do not understand the question perfectly, but um, if uh, uh, if you are referring to uh, you know the the, cent the the black holes at the center of galaxies which are accreting gas and other matter around it, um, yes. uh, the limit is set by something that we um, uh, know as Eddington limit, and that essentially uh, you know uh, kind of uh, limits the accretion onto the black hole. Um, the black holes cannot be cannot accrete uh, beyond that particular limit uh, if if it answers uh, the question to some extent yes thank you um, so there are many other questions um, so there is the question how does a black hole warp time maybe a question for suresh Yeah, sure. Uh, it's not, I mean, uh, the point is that uh, black hole or any mass, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, it curves. I don't think it will work, is the correct uh, word to use. It uh, causes the, uh, it could be the gravitation can be understood as the curvature coming from the curve, space time getting curved, space and time, not just space or time at all. And so, I mean, I, otherwise I don't know the answer to, I mean, it's not warping, but it's just curving of space, space time. And there's nothing special about black holes. Any mass will do the same. Mm -hmm. So a, a question for Dawood, it's a very general, a very broad question. What is entropy? Uh, what is entropy is the question, Jerome, right? Yes. Ah, yes. So, uh, well, uh, that is the question which can be answered at many different levels. Okay, uh, the classic uh, notion of entropy that we have from what you can call as mechanics of collection of many particles is that you just look at a system, you look at a, uh, how do I put it? You look at a, a at a configuration of a system where you can jot down its position and momentum of every particle. Think of, think of a box of an ideal gas. Okay, you can keep track, if you could keep track of position and momentum of each particle in the gas, there would be no uncertainty in your knowledge about the state of the gas, but of course you cannot do it. Okay, so what you do is uh, you take averages over uh, the position and momentum of the particles in a space which is called as a phase space. Okay, and this process is called as coarse graining. Okay, so basically the simplest answer to the question, what is entropy is, uh, uh, it is something which is proportional to the volume, volume of not your ordinary space, but volume of ordinary space multiplied by volume corresponding to the momentum of the particles. Okay, and uh, a quantity defined as proportional to the volume, roughly proportional to the volume is often given the name of entropy. Uh, at a level of quantum mechanics, the definition is slightly uh, more involved because then you cannot describe particles of a system. Like if you have a box of ideal gas, without quantum mechanics, you would have uh, described the trajectory of each particle and its momentum. Quantum mechanics forbid you to do that. Okay, you can only have what is called as a wave function of the system. And then there is a notion of entropy defined in terms of an object constructed from this wave function. Okay. But in, in some sense, very broad uh, 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 
non equation based way of understanding entropy is it is something which is measuring some sort of disorder in a system that's classically what how entropy was understood or defined but it's the refinement of this concept both in classical and quantum mechanics which is along the lines of what i just indicated if you have quantum mechanics you want to extract or you want to quantify how much information you can gain given the wave function of a system of many particles okay so it is something which is going to be a measure but this time a quantum measure of our lack of knowledge about the system so i hope that it's a deep question but i hope it actually uh, puts <laughs> puts the person asking it on the right track to find the look for the answer it's just a brief thank over. you very yeah. yeah thank you very much uh, there is a question for sriram i guess can you explain anisotropy a little bit more yeah sure sure joe what 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 happens is as follows as i mentioned we are bathed in this thermal radiation and uh, you can or another way of looking at it is you are seeing this thermal radiation streaming into streaming to us from different directions of the sky you start measuring the temperature at different directions of the sky until the third or even the fourth decimal place the temperature of this cosmic microwave background in different directions of the sky is the same in other words is anis it is isotropic that is the same in all directions of the sky up to one part in 10 to the power 4 the moment you start measuring at one decimal place higher at temperatures up to the fifth decimal place as you start looking at different directions of the sky the temperature is different so the temperature of the cosmic microwave background i had mentioned that it is perfectly plankian spectrum it is determined by a unique temperature the temperature is the same in all directions of the sky up to the fourth decimal place you say that the universe is isotropic to that level one part in 10 to power 4 but the moment you look at the fifth decimal place you start seeing differences in temperature in different directions of the sky those red blue yellow and green dots that you had i had on the slide you know as observed by this mission called planck was these anisotropies that is differences in temperature of one part in 10 to the 5 in different directions of the sky those are referred to as the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background thank you uh, there is a question for uh... Uh, for um that would maybe uh what is the significance of ligo india i think what is ligo india i guess is the question maybe maybe chandra will be able to come in maybe about. chandra yes yes maybe chandra uh yeah um so uh so let me uh, try to explain it in uh, very simple words so um uh, essentially if you just use uh, you know uh, 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 two detectors that are there for gravitational waves in the us you are essentially dealing with uh, a detector which is uh, as large as the the us uh, the size of the us but if you put another detector in india then you are essentially having a detector which is the size of half of the hemisphere or oh, sorry the the hemisphere the, the the northern hemisphere and this essentially helps us resolving uh, the sources or you know um, uh, locating the gravitational wave sources which is very important because uh, you know once we give this information to our electromagnetic partners they can direct their telescopes and look for some further signatures and so on so the biggest uh, thing that ligo india is going to do is to enhance the size of the network uh, which will help us uh, you know look uh, uh, you know at smaller patches or locate the sources in the smaller patches of the sky which can be followed up uh, by the electromagnetic uh, telescopes further 
so that's one of the okay. one of the things we can we can immediately think how ligo india will be useful thank you uh, now a question for dawood a very uh, difficult and deep question does any theory discuss the origin of time yeah, i think dawood is facing some challenge in connecting dawood are you there ah. yeah yeah i am i have reconnected uh, okay, okay 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 yes yeah so uh, jerome i i hear the question is about origin of time is it yes is there any theory that could discuss or explain the origin of time uh well as jerome already said uh, and alerted it's actually a very deep and difficult question <laughs> there are ideas about uh, describing the origin of time there are several ideas uh, starting from uh, you know the kind of work where you actually apply quantum mechanics in the very early universe and try to explain how one dimension of time and three dimension of state uh, space could have originated but these are all ideas which have eventually i think got to be validated by a complete model of early universe so yes there are a uh, lot of speculations and ideas about how you would i guess your question is uh, the complete question is why do we have one dimension of time and three of space okay because if you were living in a four dimensional space you would just be asking why is it four dimensional but since we live in a four dimensional space time origin of time is equivalent to asking why do we have three dimensions of space and one of time so there are ideas trying to do it using quantum mechanics by hawking uh, people like stephen hawking uh, gibbons and another school uh, uh, willenkin and all those guys so there there have been people working it's an area called as quantum cosmology which tries to do it to some extent okay but i think uh, the final uh, uh, the final answer is something we don't know it has to come from a complete framework for quantum gravity that is i think the best i can uh, indicate yeah thank you so i guess there is a follow up question for chandra is ligo india operational and if not when do we expect it to be um uh, so jerome uh, was it about the timeline uh, i i missed the initial yes. part of the question is is ligo india operational and if not when do we expect it to be no uh, it, it is under construction at the moment um and and we we are hoping that uh, you know um, around 2025 26 uh, it should start taking data uh, at at some 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 sensitivity yeah. around 2026 25 i guess okay thank you uh, there is a question for maybe ayan uh, can a black hole influence any experimental results done on earth yeah well uh, well not if it is very far away and unless it produces a black hole in, on earth itself as i said in a particle collider i don't know what exactly uh, what exactly uh, the question is uh, about uh, yeah it's some specific yeah answer is no of course the black holes are typically very far away but certainly when black black holes are merging we do do see the gravitational waves although it is uh, being uh, uh, like uh, it's is very far away we can see this tiny effects which is a movement of the scale of 1000 of the radius of a proton and uh, but this this is a very extreme event right because uh, you are these kind of events are producing gravitational waves which have energy which is five times or uh, several times the mass of the sun so that amount of energy is being uh, converted to, to gravitational waves and still we are only seeing only 1000 of the uh, movement of this so yeah black holes can probably cause extreme events which can see us but still they're extremely tiny effects and we need very powerful detectors to see them and the gravitational waves is one of the one window to see just see such extreme events otherwise uh, to if you want to really see 
quantum properties of black holes, you probably have to produce it directly in a collider or be very lucky, as I said, to have some something very close to Earth. Thank you. A question for uh, Suresh. Does anti deciter and conformal theory help in understanding uh, the nature of quantum gravity? And if yes, can you explain how? Okay, so uh, uh, it can, so anti deciter space is a space with uh, negative curvature, while to allow a good, pretty good approximation we are flat space or slightly positive uh, with something with a uh, deciter because of acceleration. So in that sense, uh, anti-deciter space is, uh, is an, again a toy uh, situation, but it's, uh, things are in control. So, there are, so it's, uh, what is very interesting is that it's a duality which relates quantum field theory on one side and quantum gravity on the other side. But what is weak on one side is strong on the other side. So quite often, a lot of progress in the past 15, 20 years has been to use uh, classical gravity to explain some quantum field theory effects. But in the last few years, now we are actually trying to use uh, quantum field theory aspects to address uh, problems uh, associated with black holes, formation, et cetera. So yeah, so the answer is that this is work is, is ongoing research. And uh, hopefully there will be some, there are already some fairly strong results and beautiful connections with uh, quantum information, quantum computation, et cetera. And so yes, the answer is yes, we, we, people are studying these things. Uh, so Suresh, uh, maybe uh, I can yeah, add a little ahead, bit. You can to, add, you can add. Yeah, it, uh, just uh, because, uh, yeah. So, uh, so the main thing is it's a very good example of what gravity really people think of gravity is because there is a proposal that gravity should be understood as a hologram, that it emerges from, uh, from the boundary, some degrees of freedom that live in the boundary of space time. And this is exactly what, uh, and there's a good reason to believe this is a general principle, because suppose uh, you have some gas in the room, and then you put in more and more and more, uh, more matter inside the room. I mean, if you put in a lot of, lot of matter in the room, then of course, everything will collapse and form a black hole. But the area, but the entropy of the black hole, entropic then uh, is essentially the area. So basically, it will be the area of the room, right? And that's the maximum entropy that you can have. So essentially, uh, but anyway, so you don't see that because it's, this area has to be measured in Planck units. That's a lot and lot of entropy. So, so basically, you believe that the maximum, uh, so gravity should kind of be holographic because it's uh, degrees of freedom at the boundary. And this can be said in a nice and coherent way. And ADS CFT is one example, was, it's the only example where we really understand how it works, how space can emerge. So there is a version of that, which also talks about how time can emerge, which is a DS version of that, but that's much, much less, for, much less understood. So ADS CFT is promising because of this reason, because it can ask, answer many questions about quantum gravity. Thank you. So maybe there is a, another question that you can take. Uh, uh, the question is, I am wondering what happens when we are inside the black hole? So, well, that's again a very, very deep question. And that's exactly the kind of questions people, that's actually at the cutting edge of research today. And uh, so, so there is some remarkable calculations which uh, tell us that uh, we, again, there are some extensions of ADS CFT which tell us. So suppose if you take, uh, you think of ADS black hole like a uh, black hole in a box. Uh, black space black holes are not like that. ADS in ADS black holes like a box. And then you can connect that box to something, some kind of a bath that collects Hawking radiation. And then there are concrete proposals that uh, which tell you that how it, uh, that how this Hawking radiation. Actually, uh, so initially people thought that what Hawking's computation told us that this radiation is purely thermal. So you basically lose a, a complete information about this black hole. But now what ADS CFT has told us something really remarkable is that you don't need to change the semi-classical space time, but there are some hidden saddles or some hidden uh, configurations that we missed. And if you take into account those configurations, just you don't have you can trust the semi-classical or this classical gravity space time the classical description of black hole is still valid 
but still you could show that there's some tiny exponentially small effects very very tiny small effects but you add them up then indeed information starts leaking leaking out and you can basically decode the interior of the black hole from outside and the radical proposal is somehow that the outside of the black this, this outside region and the interior of the black hole is connected by some kind of wormhole and uh, indeed uh, so this is through this that there are good models where explicit cal calculation we are showing such things and you could basically come to know about uh, there's a precise way uh, that you can decode the interior of the black hole uh, so this is at the cutting edge of research and this is this is a kind of questions so if we know the answer to the question we can actually resolve a lot of paradoxes about black holes because black holes are interesting because uh, they raise a lot of fundamental paradoxes which tell us that somehow quantum mechanics and gravity cannot be compatible together and these paradoxes are made very sharp by application of quantum information theory and these kind of things that i've told about this wormhole connections they are the they seem to be the only way that you can resolve these kind of quantum information paradoxes so basically uh, this kind of ads cft is showing us the right way to understand how what, how the interior of the black hole can look like and what kind of physics we can use to describe that but that's all i can say for now Thank you. Uh, the next question, I guess, is for uh, Chandra. In fact, this question is very close to a question that has already been asked. But uh, the, so the question is, if a black hole does not emit any light, then how the Einstein telescope took the image of, of, of the black hole? Um, um, so, uh, so we did not detect or we, we are not seeing something that is coming from within the black hole, but we are trying to take a snapshot of what, ha what is happening, you know, just outside the, let's say the boundary of a black hole, which we call event horizon. So uh, whatever we get, whether uh, through uh, what event horizon telescope did or uh, gravitational wave observations, we are actually seeing the effect of uh, you know black holes on the surroundings rather than getting something from within the black holes. I, I hope uh, that that answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so there is a well, maybe this is a question for for Sriram. The question is, what is your point of view about parallel universe? So I guess maybe you can you could comment on the. On the, on the concept of multiverse that is claimed to emerge generically from the inflationary theory? Yeah, so the challenge is as follows, right? I mean, you can have these multiverses and the challenge is to understand whether there is any relation between what we have here and the other universes that are present. Um, my personal view is that you know, if there is no way of observing those other multiverses and there is no predictions to be made, um, it is not clear how it is going to help us arrive at a theory. Um, multiverses may exist, uh, but what role can they have in allowing us, you know, if we can't observe what happens in those multiverses, what are the various parameters describing masses of particles, for instance, in those multiverses. If we do know, if there is no way of observing them, there is, of course, a challenge of, you know, um, of their utility in constructing a physical picture. So that's that's my view about the multiverses, Joe. Maybe, maybe you, you yourself may be able to comment about it further, more than me. <laughs> I'm not sure, but... Uh, what is your yeah. view, for instance? Um, I, I think it's a very uh, speculative concept. I am not sure that it's really, uh, I, I'm not convinced it's a generic prediction from inflation. I think it's, a, mm -hmm. it's, it's in some sense a separate package from, from the theory of inflation mm -hmm. because, I mean, one has to, to understand that the, the, the multiverse is a consequence uh, of the back reaction of the quantum fluctuation on uh, the background space time and in a regime where these uh, fluctuations are actually large. not fluctuation but are, are very large. large. And so this means that uh, to be uh, 
completely uh, honest, we should say that this is probably in the regime where quantum gravity is important. And uh, since it's well known that we don't have a satisfactory uh, theory of quantum gravity, I think it's a very strong speculation to infer that uh, the multiverse exists from what we know about the inflationary theory. So I would say it's interesting, but it's at this stage, I would be very cautious about this, uh, uh, I mean, th this theory. Uh, yes, maybe, uh, well, we are, we are uh, yes, there is another question maybe for Chandra, it's what's, what's the difference between a supermassive black hole and a normal black hole? This. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, this, uh, so many terms are used like super and uh, you know, intermediate and so on. They essentially represent uh, the size of the black hole or the mass uh, the particular black hole you know, may represent. Um, typically, uh, supermassive black holes uh, uh, are uh, a million solar mass uh, black holes, while uh, the stellar, solar, stellar mass black holes are typically uh, of the order of, uh, you know, uh, 30 solar masses or, or smaller. Mm -hmm. So... Well, there is a question again about, it's a follow-up, I guess, from the, from the previous question. Uh, would it ever be possible to have a closed system with decreasing entropy? So who wants to take this question? Uh, Sorry, can you repeat the question, Jerome? I didn't hear you correctly. Would it ever, would it ever be possible to have a closed system with decreasing entropy? The, the second law forbids it, right? Yeah, I guess this is, yes. I yeah, guess this the is. second law forbids it, so. so the, the answer is yes, if, if you violate the second law second of thermodynamics. Law. Yes. <laughs> yes, if you want to keep the second law valid, you know, maintain the validity of the second law, that is not possible. Yes. Uh, well, I think maybe uh, we should stop at this point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Jerome. Absolutely. Um, uh, I think Ayan was asking whether you wish to make any remarks about the center, Jerome? Well, I find the center a uh, very interesting and fascinating idea, and I am just eager to visit it. Absolutely. I hope this will be possible soon. It's, of course, not obvious given the, well, you know, the condition regarding the pandemic, and uh, but I it seems that the situation is improving. So I hope I will have the chance very soon to travel again yes. to, 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 to IIT Madras and to visit this new center, which I think is a very exciting uh, center. And uh, I, I guess you are very lucky to have this new tool to make research at the highest international level. So really, I, I'm eager to visit this new center. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you. Uh, Suresh Chandra uh, Dawood, um, I believe uh, we have answered most of the questions. Fine. Are there, do you wish to make any remarks? Ayan? Well, uh, hi, Jerome. It's uh, good to see you and <laughs> hope, hope to meet you in IIT Madras. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Jerome, we are hoping that, uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, um, have visitors on campus very soon. And we are also looking forward to your visit as soon as it is possible. And uh, you. we will stay in touch. Um, Thank you. Rudra? Yes, Professor. We have yeah. answered most yeah. of the question, a good fraction of the question. I believe they can write to us if they have further contact one of us for further questions. Are there any closing remarks you wish to make? 
uh, I am in nothing professor, nothing specific, but I would like to thank you uh, once again for making this uh, event a grand, grand success. And, and I should be thanking uh, Professor Jerome Martin as well, taking his time to uh, uh, attend this webinar. I'm looking forward to meet you here at IIT Madras soon, Professor. Me too. And, Me too. And thank you once again, audience. Uh, please, uh, looking forward to meet you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Suresh, thank Dao, you. Chandra. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you all. We'll stay bye. in touch. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 bye.